the first question is that how the enol uh, gets generated and uh, if i understood it right it is related to the glitag uh, platform where the uh, enol base intermediate uh, was generated uh, for the subsequent reaction with the uh, aldehyde now this is where if you will notice that uh, so when hydrogen bond activation is something that is stabilizes a certain intermediate you can lower down the barrier for the formation of that intermediate and that is why the hydrogen bond acceptors that were placed in the proximity uh, to the uh, imine that would be generated uh, that was very very critical and uh, we tuned that uh, with a variety of uh, functional groups uh, various hydrogen bond acceptors and uh, uh, then selected which ones work better in fact uh, we were able to see uh, signs of some of those and uh, in the case of substituted amino acids we found that uh, it doesn't happen at all um, now it's not very surprising because you would realize that the hydrogen bond activation and the stabilization energy is heavily dependent on the uh, orbital or, uh, overlap and that is again heavily dependent on the orientations of the orbitals so um, that's that's the whole uh, you know physical organic chemistry behind the generation of the enol intermediates now the second question um, okay is uh, what is the work of the resin in the glitag platform okay so um, in the glitag uh, chemistry what we uh, did in the beginning was took a bifunctional reagent um, and uh, that bifunctional reagent was perfectly fine for labeling the n terminus glycine of a protein now once uh, let me see if i can so I am actually sharing the screen. So uh, let me just see if I can go to the slide and tell you from there. Yeah, so uh, in this particular case, uh, I hope this is what you are uh, addressing to in terms of the requirement of resin. So in this case, what the resin does is that it captures the labeled protein. And in that case, you can very well filter off and recover the unreacted protein. And then, uh, you know, so that's a very convenient method of purification without really having to separate things uh, through regular, uh, you know, FPLC or HPLC. Uh, and then um, you are not only involving a purification step here, even in the second case, only the transoximized product is going to be released and not the one that is unreacted. So it's another step of purification. And all this can be done in a very, very quick time with almost absolute, you know, uh, mm, absolute efficiency in terms of uh, what you will get as a purified material. Whereas if you are going to use um, uh, any of the uh, regular LC methods, uh, then in that case, you lose a lot of material. In this case, the overall loss is less than five to 10%. Um, now, I hope that is where your question was uh, uh, related to. Whereas in the other case, when we use uh, this, it is for a very com different reason. Over here, we do not want to install, uh, uh, you know, any probe on the protein rather we want to purify a protein uh, from the mixture of uh, proteins and in this scenario uh, you know you would need a completely different set of uh, chemistry because the release chemistry becomes very important and this becomes even more valuable for therapeutic proteins because you would not like to have metal contaminants uh, over there so um, okay Now, how does the polarity of the protein environment affects your uh, DIN method? Okay. Um, 
so that is something um, uh, so the question is more about you know um, the structure of the protein the uh, overall polar and non polar domains uh, how are they going to affect the overall chemistry um, whether it is uh, from den or without den uh, any chemical method for that matter right uh, now that would not be so straightforward to answer at this stage because deconvoluting the parameters that comes from uh, the chemical reactivity and selectivity as such and then each of those intrinsic parameters in terms of binding the uh, you know the effect of the hydrophobic versus the polar domains uh, that uh, will take a lot of uh, uh, more work uh, where it has to integrate systematic control experiments with biophysical investigations and only then such questions can be answered i think we are at least a few years away from um, that type of information but what i can tell you is that um, solvent accessible uh, residues only do get modified in all the chemistry uh, that we do. So that is again a very critical point uh, where we want to do certain modifications, but we do not really want to perturb the structure or the activity of the protein or enzyme or antibody. So um, that's that's something that plays a role. Okay, um, this glytac can distinguish glycine from beta alanine or gamma aminobutyric acid. So far, uh, we have not uh, tested uh, any um, thing beyond natural amino acids. Um, we believe, uh, you know, that subtle structural changes could have effect on this, specifically if you see the success of this chemistry is dependent on the uh, appropriate orbital overlaps. So. Um, you know, it, I think it will be a little bit too far-fetched uh, to comment on how uh, and taking uh, anything which is beyond natural amino acid would affect um, the glytac chemistry. So I'll, I'll probably uh, reserve that uh, statement uh, or answer till we try that out. Uh, which enzymes are mostly used for kinetic studies and why? Um, so I, I do not know if this question is uh, directly related to our work. Uh, the enzymes that we use mostly in uh, bioconjugation are the ones that are relatively uh, stable. Um, so that at least when we are developing the methods and we have used uh, uh, at least four to six of them um, um, where we find that the uh, chemistry operates pretty conveniently, but then, you know, when you go for enzymes like proteases and all, where self-degradation comes into play, uh, then things get a little tricky. So even though we have worked with so, such things, but then you have to figure out a way to stabilize them uh, so that you can, you know, while you're doing the chemistry, it does not start uh, self-degrading. Okay, um, so there is a question from Anand Muthaya, uh, is the spacer rigid? Okay, well, thanks for asking this question. This is a very good question. And this is something that uh, we were wondering in the beginning that, uh, you know, if, uh, let me just show it to you then. Um, so the point was that uh, over here, we are assuming that FH can only explore this histidine. But if this is conformationally flexible, then it can explore a wide range of uh, uh, substrates around it. Uh, and that's why uh, the question becomes uh, relevant. So in the in the beginning, um, so in the beginning, the whole point was that uh, we, uh, we wanted to make certain rigid spacers, and we did that. Um, and they were a bit more uh, selective in the terms of which protein they are going to work with. And things were not so straightforward because then you also have to take care of the solubility. Now, what you were seeing in today's results is not from that category. Uh, this is a completely redesigned 
uh, segment where what exactly happens is that after fk reacts with a particular lysine before that this is completely conformational flexible uh, conformationally flexible is this would explore all the potential um, conformational domain that would be available to us uh, or to this under the aqueous conditions but as soon as the fk uh, forms linchpin with the lysine then we systematically place heteroatoms in this spacer that is starts forming hydrogen bond with the surface of the protein so yes it is rigid but it becomes rigid only after forming the linchpin so it is adoptable rigidity and the other thing you would realize is that this adoptable rigidity allows us to use this reagent for more than one proteins because different proteins different domains will have different types of surfaces so it can adopt according to the surface and that is a critical reason of why we have so many reagents working with so many proteins uh, if it was not completely clear uh, please do feel free to drop me an email and i will love to elaborate with data can ph of the medium uh, varied in order to target n terminal amine and lysine uh, amine separately uh, another good question uh, it is uh, completely uh, valid uh, you can control ph and that definitely helps you uh, because the pka of the n terminal alpha amine and the lysine that has epsilon amine they are different so you can regulate ph if you increase the ph you will see that lysine will start participating in the reaction much faster than the n terminal sulfur amine right uh, but in our chemistry uh, as you would notice that um, you know we were more focused on uh, how eventually we will be doing things in the uh, live cells and the animal models so going beyond physiological conditions was uh, kind of inhibited uh, in our uh projects um but yes there are examples uh, you can control it um but n terminus modification is something that you can still get with high efficiency for lysine modification yeah there there will be still some issues with uh, selectivity now the next question is if any uh, branch proteins having more than one free g or glycine how to control the site selectivity or how to control the uh, selectivity so i hope i was clear in the fact that you know any internal glycine is not going to uh, participate in the reaction so if you look carefully into the mechanism and this mechanism would only allow the n terminus glycine uh, to participate in the reaction and so no internal glycine whatsoever would uh, participate yes if you can have a protein which has more than one chains and then you have more than one n terminus glycine uh, then uh, you will definitely have a competition so then you will have to change the tricks a little bit and uh, or for that matter if you have uh, more than a few proteins in a complex mixture of protein and you want to target only one of them at n terminus glycine then uh, there are other tricks uh, that is something that's going on in our lab and probably i'll be glad to discuss uh, after uh, a year or so okay so the next question is uh it's very interesting that organic molecules associates with proteins show a wide range of biological applications what will be activity if organic molecules have metal or halogen as substituents um okay well what i would say is that um this is also something that a couple of groups are trying to pursue uh, when they but uh, they normally do not look into the uh precision bio conjugation in that regard so uh, i do remember uh, seeing some of the paper where um unnatural amino acid based uh, proteins were utilized for installation of uh, uh, probes that had halogens and that was for a different purpose um, and as well as metal so yeah but there are uh, definite applications for that as well and uh, there are a few groups that are looking into uh some of those applications um does your epoxide ring get 
opened by ring nitrogens on DNA bases. This might help a stitch protein DNA interactors. Uh, thanks for asking this question. Uh, so, yeah, I wish uh, I would have an answer. So, so far we have, uh, we were busy solving challenges with proteins. Uh, and uh, yeah, very recently we have just started planning to work with uh, protein DNA and protein RNA complexes. Uh, so protein RNA to begin with and protein DNA at a later stage. But uh, we will, uh, we are definitely interested in um, this idea of uh, trying to uh, figure out the interactome of a protein uh, uh, based on precision chemistry. And, and that's that's really something, if it will work out, it will be a fantastic uh, tool for uh, biology. And uh, yeah, feel free to drop me a message uh, if you're working in something like this and you want to discuss this further. Uh, tumor environment is acidic is nature. Is your chemistry acid sensitive? Um, yeah, thanks for asking this question again. Um, yeah, well, it is acidic, uh, that's true. But if you look into the difference of pH, uh, I think more than pH, uh, the density of the tumor and the heterogeneity of the tumor is a bigger problem. So, uh, so far we have uh, not noticed something substantial, but you know, at the same time, uh, the real differences would start surfacing up when we are looking for uh, an actual tumor in vivo. Uh, we have not done those investigations yet, uh, but we are definitely looking forward to test that out. So hopefully next year or two, I'll be able to answer this question more, but it will be difficult to deconvolute the exact effect, whether the changes in the effect is because of the pH or because of the other heterogeneity factors of the tumor. Uh, what are the possible methods or instruments to check the site selectivity of drug in protein chain? Okay, so all the uh, molecules that I showed to you, all the bioconjugates and antibody drug conjugates, um, they were analyzed uh, by uh, proteomics tools. So mass spectrometry is the uh, common thing that we use with every experiment that we perform. So you take uh, MS of uh, the protein, when it comes to the antibody, MS will not be that great. So you will have to go through, uh, you know, specific degradations and then go for MS. Then uh, peptide mapping after further degradation and then MS, MS at the end. So these are few things. And uh, with protein conjugates, we have de uh, developed already technologies and tools uh, that provide us uh, uh, very, uh, you know, powerful uh, data in terms of, uh, um, you know, unambiguous uh, characterization. Uh, with ADCs, we have developed another tool uh, that we like to call a sensitivity booster. Uh, and that specific sensitivity booster is what allows us to uh, identify the exact site of conjugations. But yes, I agree that it's not trivial. Okay. Are the reagents being used for the control of a stereo selectivity, not adding up to the toxicity of the protein or causing cell death? Uh, well, okay, I, I wish um, that would have been the case, then we would have another potent toxin, uh, but uh, no. So you would have noticed that uh, the ADCs were used at two nanomolar level. So even though the we, we did not really showed you the control data with the LDM reagent, but um, you know, in that concentration range, uh, they really have no toxicity. Uh, how about toxicity of uh, side products in retro glytech chemistry? Um, so I'm not sure if uh, you mean uh, PLP by that. Uh, so in retro glytech chemistry, uh, what we are using is PLP. Uh, that's the only additional thing. So, and, and that is pretty okay. Uh, so uh, in the concentration that it is used, it's, it's all fine. It's not really uh, toxic. But at the same time, um, you know, since it, it is already something that we know about from literature, um, uh, we still will have to uh, test that up to what concentration limits we can go up to. That we don't know, but in the concentration range that we typically work, it is already uh, pretty okay. 
small molecules like biotin are also known to be cancer cell specific. Uh, so why do we need such protein modification? Um, again, thanks for asking. As you would notice, uh, even the molecule that I showed to you, yeah. So what you would notice here is that, um, so if you look at DM1, uh, you know, even, um, okay, maybe not this example. Yeah, so when you look at DM1, you will notice that uh, this also has the specificity towards the HER2 positive cell. It inhibits it much more than it inhibits the HER2 negative cell. So when we uh, talk about that specificity, it's perfectly fine. Yes, they are specific, but they will also kill the uh, normal cells. Uh, when we are talking about ADCs, we are talking about you know killing uh, the HER2 positive cells with high specificity without really doing any harm to the normal cells. So that's the level of difference in directed therapeutics versus, uh, you know, something like uh, a toxin um, that would be used otherwise. Okay, what about uh, physiological stability of these protein conjugates? So yeah, that's a good question. In fact, uh, when it comes to the ADC application, uh, you would need both uh, something that's not super stable and you would need something that's super stable. Uh, the reason is that um, when you are targeting tumors of different types with different densities and heterogeneities, uh, for certain cases, uh, you would like to, when the internalization doesn't work that well, you would like that uh, uh, toxin to be released. And that's where you would want a relatively less stability. But for all the other cases, you would need high stability. So depending on what chemistry we are using, when we do histidine modification, uh, there is, or when we attach the toxins to the histidine, I do expect that uh, some of uh, the toxin would be released. Uh, even before reaching the tumor cell. But when it comes to the lysine-based conjugation, uh, that would not happen. So both these categories of ADCs will be useful for different types of uh, tumors that we are looking at. Now, uh, can't we link two drugs to single ADC? Uh, yes, uh, we can. In fact, uh, multi-drug conjugation is something that's... Uh, we are also working at, and I know that there are other groups, including few companies, uh, on, who are working on it. Uh, and that's that's something that's ongoing. Yes, uh, we can, and that has its own benefits. So that's something that is uh, that you will is you will see uh, in last one or two years. There are a few papers already, and there are more that are going to come in that uh, segment. Is precise engineering of uh, protein. That could be utilized for um, developing selective covalent inhibitors. Okay, uh, Sharad, thanks for asking this question. This is exactly what I was telling you. Uh, that's exactly where we are heading in the long term. We want to uh, do that uh, precise engineering of certain proteases uh, that we are looking at. Um, and uh, that's what I was trying to compare it with the various kinase inhibitors that they still go for, uh, you know, multiple targets. And it would be really impressive and useful if we can develop, uh, you know, very well understood pathways of uh, precisely engineering proteins so that we can then control uh, the specificity and develop selective covalent inhibitors. So that's what I meant by uh, precision therapeutics with the small molecules. Uh, can this work? Uh, can this process also work for COVID treatment? Um, feel free to do that. It's possible, uh, but um, the point is that the I, I really think that um, when it comes to COVID treatment or developing the therapeutics for it, the timeline that uh, we have uh, for addressing that question is really less. And the uh, stage at which this uh, precision engineering technologies are. Uh, it would take a lot more time than what it is uh, 
required. So I'm pretty sure that the alternative pathways for the treatment uh, would uh, be able to uh, reach the goals faster. So yeah, but if somebody, it, it, it doesn't have to be just COVID. If you're looking for any specific target protein, it should be possible. Um, okay, um, thanks for asking. Um, uh, Surbi, uh, so how the animal model will be created for the testing? Um, I guess the first round of animal models that uh, we have in plan is uh, where, uh, you know, the tumors will be uh, created subcutaneously. Uh, so that will be step one. Um, and I hope that uh, we restore normalcy as quickly as possible so that we can start some of those testing. But subcutaneous models will be the first step. And then we will move on uh, forward uh, towards the uh, internal organs as well at, at some point of time. Aren't immunes susceptible to hydrolysis? Can you, s oh yeah, for sure. Uh, in fact, uh, what I did not specify due to lack of time, uh, immunes are susceptible to hydrolysis and we do not want to suppress that hydrolysis. We just want to control it. So what you will notice is that, um, let me just show you one reagent and you will realize what I mean. So this uh, aldehyde, when it forms amine as such, if you do not have this hydroxyl group, then the equilibrium will fo you know, push the amine more towards uh, the uh, you know, the free form, uh, the amine and the aldehyde. This hydroxyl is really critical to stabilize the amine. And that's uh, something that took us some time to figure out. Uh, but uh, this hydroxyl is critical for the stabilization of amine. And that is uh, why the linchpin is, uh, I, I would say it has, uh, we can control that reversibility. So the when we do the hydrozone formation or transoximization, that's when it's, uh, you know, that is what allows us to release that completely. Otherwise, it, it it's really stable. You can actually just remove epoxide add this reagent into aldehydes uh, so in the proteins and by ms you can observe that multiple amines are formed in the aqueous medium and they are pretty stable otherwise but yes dynamics will be still involved so uh, two questions regarding the glytec platform uh, for the selective modification of n-terminus glycine with an aromatic aldehyde how many equivalents of this aldehyde was necessary to modify the protein for the isolation of modified insulin with the bis aldehyde in a hydroxide resin. Uh, have you found some non specific labeling of lysine side chains with the aldehyde, thus leading to the isolation of those non desired modified proteins? Oh, okay. Uh, thanks for asking this question. Um, so I, I'm, I'm pretty sure that you have been. Um, looking into some of this uh, chemistry, uh, because this is a question that does need, uh, you know, a clear understanding of what exactly is going on. <laughs> so uh, yes, uh, the num so you will typically, if you want to accelerate the reaction, uh, you know, you can uh, push the equivalents of um, um, the aldehyde uh, even to 200 equivalents to 500 equivalents, and uh, you will still not observe any non-specific reaction uh, with the aldehydes that I showed in the slides, okay? Uh, there are a few derivatives that could get non-specific uh, to some extent. So, uh, you know, that again brings us uh, to the same position that if your hydrogen bond acceptor uh, is, uh, if its relative position is affected, then in that scenario, uh, there will be certain non-specific issues. And, um, is, you know, the reason why I think you have a great understanding of this is because, yeah, lysine side chains are the one that would start interfering into some of these cases with some of the derivatives. But with every glytag reagent that I showed on this slide, that would not be the case. But uh, please feel free to drop uh, me a mail. I'll be glad to discuss uh, about uh, what experiences you had in this regard. Uh, so that we can probably uh, share some of uh, the findings. Do the glytag uh, has any influence on altering the 
uh, hydrophobicity of the protein. Okay, well, it, it again uh, depends. Uh, see, normally if you're working with large proteins, this is small tags would not have drastic impact. Uh, but at the same time, if you're working with, let's say, a relatively small uh, protein, which is somewhere between a big peptide and a small protein, uh, then you will have the effect. So it all depends on how big your probe is with respect to the size of the protein. Uh, have you tried this on chiral mode? Okay, uh, thanks for asking this. Uh, I wish I can analyze the stereoselectivity uh, with proteins. Um, I must mention that I have been trying to uh, encourage some of my group members to use uh, chiral reagents uh, and uh, use both the enantiomers uh, and then see uh, or, or monitor the rates of reaction. So see how the kinetics gets affected by the choice of the uh, particular stereo isomer of the electrophilic center. Um, turns out that, uh, you know, I have not been able to excite my group members to do that for various reasons. Um, and the access to some of those reagents is definitely not so straightforward. But that's a very good question. And I'm very sure that uh, the rates of the reactions would definitely be uh, different depending on what enantiomer you're taking. Uh, so I guess I already answered um, this question. Uh, I'll skip this. Uh, what about the pH dependence of the amino alcohol synthesis? Uh, this is uh, pretty fine. Uh, so, you, you know, amino alcohols, actually we tried various conditions, including pH to kind of dissociate that carbon-carbon bond. Uh, so uh, that study actually told us that they are pretty robust otherwise. Uh, so they don't really disintegrate that easily. Um, and you do need the special conditions like POP to uh, dissociate them. Uh, the next question is, uh, can you please share how you came up with the idea that types of reaction could happen? Um, so, you know, yeah, don't assume that everything we thought worked. Uh, so behind every, uh, you know, plan that worked, there are a good number of plans that did not work. Uh, so, you know, the credit goes to the students as well who were involved. Uh, they were remarkable in terms of uh, debating, discussing. And since a lot of this thing was unknown, uh, so yeah, it, it's, it's in the beginning, it was a lot about imagination, but now we understand a fair bit of what physical organic chemistry happens and how that can be regulated. So now coming up with hypothesis-driven research is relatively um, you know, easier. Uh, formation of amide bond between the drug and protein through linker can provide targeted therapeutic cancer cells. Are these formed amide bonds stable in blood so we can get efficient delivery of drug at target site? Uh, so yes, so, uh, means people have used amide bond, Easter bond, um, and a few others, uh, and they have shown um, sufficient stability uh, in the blood serum. So uh, blood serum tests, they are pretty fine, uh, but um, you know, in fact, some of those drugs already have utilized uh, um, the amide and Easter bonds. So we know that those bonds will be definitely fine. But with histidine, we do not know because there you have a carbon heteroatom bond uh, and that uh, we still need to test before we can comment further. Uh, we have already addressed this question. Approximately what percentage of total population of potential target proteins in the cell lysine? Okay, so okay, so what happens is that depending on whether you are taking a bacterial cell or um, you know human cell, uh, you will the number of proteins will be very different. Now, what I have not. Uh, so the examples that I showed in some of those cases, we had overexpressed recombinant protein, and in some of the other cases, uh, we just had the normal concentration, but we still were targeting the proteins that were higher in concentration with respect to the others. So if you control the chemistry well, you will be able to target one protein predominantly, more than 90%, and a little bit traces of maybe the other one in some cases, but that can also be avoided. But it is true that if you incubate it, for, you need to basically regulate that uh, with the reaction parameters. Uh, but now, 
some of the results that I did not discuss today. We do have methods where we can selectively target a protein even in lower concentration um, with high specificity. Um, can this approach be employed for protein delivery to target cells? Um, I guess, uh, you know, it all depends. It is, so such type of approaches have been uh, used for protein, uh, not just protein delivery, for that matter, delivery of uh, any cargo, or even for increasing the circulation uh, time in the blood. Uh, so those uh, examples are there. Uh, so why not? Sure, yeah. Um, is there any role of temperature? Okay, so uh, again, as I mentioned, um, you know, we uh, performed all the experiments. We were very particular about physiological conditions simply because we wanted to translate uh, the chemistry further. Um, and that's why we have not really explored uh, very high temperature or very low temperature. Uh, we have tested some of these methods between 4 degrees to 37 degrees. So that's the range that we have tested, but typically we prefer working at 23 to 25 degrees Celsius. Um, where your work can be best utilized by the industry. So, okay, so, uh, you know, as you would notice that there are a few segments where uh, the industrial interest comes into play. Uh, so installation of biophysical tools, installation of uh, imaging probes, antibody fluorophore conjugates, antibody drug conjugates. Uh, so, you know, so in, in starting from uh, the biotechnological tools all the way till therapeutics and in some fields of diagnostics uh, and biomaterials. So this is the wide range. Uh, we are interested in some of them, but obviously we cannot uh, take it forward to all the domains where this could be applied, but ranging from chemistry, biomaterials to biology to medicine, that's the domain uh, that it could eventually have impact on. Okay. Uh, so, Dr. Jha, do I still have time? Can I answer? Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. So, sir, I, uh, you can take last two, three questions if you wish to, because we okay. are already happy. Yeah. So, yeah. if you have time, take two, three questions. So uh, a quick uh, disclaimer, in case I have not been able to address your question uh, to your uh, satisfaction or the questions at the end that I might not be able to take today, please feel free to drop me a message and I'll be glad to respond to you. So I'll just take two, three more questions and uh, pass it on uh, to Dr. Jha. Eventually, to demonstrate a therapeutic efficacy of your ADCs in animal tumor models, you will need to administer them systematically, that is intravenously. That's perfectly right. Uh, in that case, serum proteins will be adsorbed uh, onto your ADCs. How will you ensure that tumor selective targeting of ADCs will not be affected due to such non specific serum protein adsorption? So, uh, so now the thing is, uh, I understand that you know there are a lot of added factors that come that can come into play. In fact, that was the reason another reason that when we were picking up our monoclonal antibody and the toxin, you would notice that what is changing is the site of conjugation, the bond strengths, the specificity, the drug to antibody ratio control, and so on and so forth. So it is taking care of multiple factors, but the fact that monoclonal antibody and the toxin remains same, it kind of gives a lot more confidence to us that, uh, you know, uh, these are the models that went all the way till uh, clinical trials into the market. So, uh, you know, we will be able to figure out some of the answers to those questions, or it might have already been figured out. But you rightly pointed out, these are a few challenges that will definitely come our way, when, especially when we are looking into the new molecules. Okay, does temperature of the tumor sites have any effect on the reactions? Uh, I do not know at this point. So we need to do in vivo uh, studies before we can comment on that. Um, do you observe any glyoxaldehyde uh, formation at the end terminus glycine? Um, okay, well, we tried that. At some point, we tried that. Uh, for slide number 20, I understand what you're asking. Um, uh, but, um, and uh, this is, I guess, referred to uh, Matt Francis's chemistry, uh, but no, uh, we did not observe that, uh, not at the concentrations at which we were working. 
because that's something that we were definitely looking for um, and it was not there okay so uh, maybe last questions uh, is there any specific re reason behind selecting lysine and histidine um, yeah lysine is the uh, one of the high frequency residues and histidine is moderately frequent uh, so they provide i would say most challenging substrates in a way uh, in for site selectivity so we knew that if we can um, harness specificity with them then we we are at the right path and we will be able to uh, translate this to uh, some of the other residues as well uh, so that was the whole point we just wanted to take something that's good enough to challenge us uh, for site selectivity Okay, so uh, I'll probably uh, take rest of the questions uh, through an email. In in case you want, uh, feel free to drop me a mail at uh, vrai at icerb.ac.in, and I'll be glad to answer these questions. Thanks a lot, uh, Dr. Jha. Over to you. Yeah. So thank you, Professor Rai, uh, for such an illustrative and insightful talk. So the lecture must have inspired very young researchers to think and define new problems in this particular area of routine research. We have got several messages in the chat box, as you might be seeing, uh, how the attendees have enjoyed this particular session and the engagement level you might have seen with the questions. So just to update you, we had more than 300 participants in this particular session, and you patiently answered all most of the questions, particularly uh, around 35 or 40. So. We'll be posting the recording of this session after a few edits on our ACS India page soon. And regarding the participants' certificate, we'll be sending it to the attendees after the end of this session. So finally, once again, uh, thank you all for your time and the wonderful participation. We'll be back with another exciting talk in the next week. Till then, stay healthy and stay safe. Uh, thank you. Yeah, thank so you everyone for joining. Thank you for time. Hope to meet you soon in person. And thank you very much. Sure. Thanks a lot. Thank you everyone for joining.